What's up everybody, today you're going to learn how to use version control using git and its basic commands. So let's just get started. If you are new to programming, version control is one of those things that you most likely want to learn at the beginning. Because it's something you're going to use over and over and over, especially if you're working on a project. But do you know what version control is? If you start inferring, you can think of it like, for example, whenever you have an application and that application might have version 0.1, version 1.2, version 1.3, version 2, and so forth, right? So in software development, while developing a product, let's say just a web application, we're going to have different stages of that application because we've been developing all of the features related to that application. So we might have the navigation panel, we might have the contact form, we might have the landing pages, all of those things, we might have broad functionality, we might have a bunch of things, right? But that takes time. Generally, an application is not built overnight. It doesn't take just one day, uh, just one person to do it. It usually takes a team of developers and a lot of time. Therefore, at the moment you're being developing feature by feature, you're gonna be able to track down who have made those changes, what time those changes were made, and what kind of changes that person uh, made on specific files, literally, even line by line, even little spaces, it's gonna, it's gonna attack those genes. What are the benefits of version control? As it, the name implies and the definition implies, being able to trace down all of the changes you have made in the past on a project is critical. And specifically, you know what's the point in time where, where, when things start happening. Basically, you can just go back, back into a version, a workable version of your product, of your application, and redeploy that or publish that into a production environment while you're working on fixing the bugs or problems. That's one of the things. If you're new to programming, this is something that you might not see right now because you need to have experience working with other developers on a project. But basically, you're going to be able to have, let's say if my team is composed by John, Charles and myself, then Charles can be working on the contact form. John can be working on the create functionality and I can be working on the delete functionality, right? Now, all of these has to happen simultaneously and can happen simultaneously from little different versions uh, that each, each of us are working from our local machines. And once we finish the development of that feature, what we could do is to merge it or insert whatever those changes we made in our local project, insert it into a hosting platform where, where the main project is going to reside and other programmers are going to have access to those latest changes. That brings another point, which is a fast development. Yes, that means that a lot of people working multiple features at the same time. If there's such a dependency, that will be, will be big, big trolls. We will have the ability to publish websites, applications, mobile applications in such a fast pace that we're doing nowadays. Finally, but not least, there's room for mistakes. Remember the example that I gave you about having versions and the version one of those versions, it just ends up being a crappy version. It just creates a bunch of bugs. There's a bunch of problems going on in an application. Well, you can just go at certain point in time where there's there was no madness at all, right? And you can just work off of that. There are different version controls available and in reality there are some of them that i've never heard of but i'm pretty sure that the most common that you're probably gonna hear is about git and mercurial git being the most popular out of all of them literally most of the companies are using this as their version control option of choice there's also version control hosting platforms. So what's a hosting platform? Well, in my previous example, I was talking about working on multiple things at the same time, multiple developers in their own machines, and then being able to merge those changes into a main version of that particular product, right? So what happens in here is that, remember, if you're working on a specific feature, in your machine, in your computer, those changes are just going to be applied on the version that you have on your computer. 
That doesn't mean that just because you develop something, I'm gonna be able to access your computer and make those changes unless we we're just working on the same computer with the same username and that's just not simply good because it's just gonna create a blocker. What happens is that we're gonna have this central repository where everybody can be able to access it. Well, not everybody, but whoever has the access to access that, that repository or that project and you're gonna be able to push those changes the latest changes that you've been working on and I can just connect to that repository at any time to pull John's changes, to pull Charles' changes, to put anybody's changes to make sure that I'm always working with the latest changes of my application. So now the most well-known version control out there are gonna be it, GitHub, Bitbucket and GitLab. GitHub being the most popular out of the three. It doesn't really matter much which, which you will learn if you learn one of them, you most likely will understand any of them because the concepts are pretty much going to be the same. One thing to take into account is that repositories or your projects in these hosting platforms, they can be either public or private. If you guess it right, public being that anybody, anybody on the internet can access your repository and you might be wondering what on earth like how on earth i would like somebody to to have access to my repository in reality there's a bunch of projects out there that are open source projects meaning that anybody can ha have access to that and can even contribute to that project but going back into the point of making a repository publicly available is because like one of the things for example is to allow to give a chance to recruiters especially to a technical team work companies if you are looking for a job in the software development industry look at your code look at the different projects you've been working on to check if, if you are really a developer first of all because in that way they can be able to filter out the people who are really not developers or they think themselves that they are developers or they just have one day of experience and they claim themselves as developers or the people who are actually been learning or working on projects and stuff like that also it allows to the recruiting team, the technical team, to see your code, see what what things you know, the, the quality of your code, your code styling, and get an idea of your experience, the quality of code you write, and of course, at the end, it's just gonna affect the, the kind of salary you're gonna get at the same time. But also, you might wanna have private repositories that nobody, unless specific people, one can have access to those projects and those projects are oftentimes if you have a product that you're monetizing out there and you really don't want anybody to have access to that particular code base just because they, somebody might just copy it and just generate a new repository and paste it and literally you all of a sudden use half competition on your product or it will allow some people with malicious intent to basically see the code and see if there are deficiencies on your code and exploit in the best way they can. And all multiple reasons as well. Make your choice. You want to have some public repositories available if you are looking for jobs, for example, or if you want to just work on your stuff and nobody and don't let anybody have access, well, just keep them private. Enough of talking and it's time to learn Git and it's basic commands. We need to download Git if you don't have it. So we're gonna do Git download and I'll include this, the link in the description below that you need to use in order to download Git into your local machine. Based on the machine you're working with, you can just download the Windows version, the Mac OS version, the Linux version and Unix version. I already downloaded the Windows version and basically you're just going to follow the basic default setup instructions whenever you run the installation. At the moment of installing Git. Now the second thing is that once you install Git, you're going to you're going to open Git Bash. If you're on a Windows machine, if you're on a Linux machine or the Mac OS machine, you probably you, you can just simply open the terminal or still you can open git bash but in this case i already opened git bash the first thing we're gonna do is to set a basic configuration the configuration such as the username and the email address in order to set up the username i'm gonna start with my the command the following command git and all of these commands are gonna start with git git and then an option we're gonna start with git config and then double hyphen global and then we're gonna type user that name. And once we type it, we're gonna find <clears throat> your name. In this case, my name in, in double quotes, on between quotes. Press enter. Perfect. We have set up our username. Now we need to set up our email address. So we can set git config global user 
that email and then I'm gonna type my example example.com if you want to check if these values were actually saved we can use the following command which is git config hyphen hyphen global then hyphen hyphen list and you check out the list you're gonna see all the default values of git you're gonna see the user email my example at example.com and username as at least the Alice. perfect it's time for you to go to your project if you have an existing project for example that you've been working on a specific application or a product go ahead and go to that particular project if you don't have any specific project well for testing purposes we're gonna create one in this case i call it git basics you can just create any any project just make sure to, to go to a specific location that you're gonna remember and then set yourself up in the terminal in bash git bash within that folder location so if you are on a different folder remember use cd and then go to that particular uh, location if you know some of the simple terminal commands i mean if you know how to use some of the basic terminal commands well you can open the file explorer and open the location where you want to have your project or you can just also use the terminal and use the basic commands uh, that i told you that i've taught in the past one of this you can see the description the link in the description above or description below perfect and once we do that in order to have a repository with git what we have to do is we have to have git in it once you do that, what's going to do is, if you look at the output, you're going to see that within our git basics folder or project, I dot git folder is being generated and that's where it's going to be tracking down all of those changes, file changes, updates, anything related to your project that has changed over time. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to generate our first commit. What's a commit? So just think about it. We have created a project, right? And uh, let's say that we're gonna create, generate an index.html file. Once you generate that index.html file, yes, th there has been a change, but we need to save that change in our repos or in our database of changes of Git to notify like, okay, at this point in time, we made this change and we generated an index.html file. And once you do that, that commit is gonna have an ID. An ID is going to symbolize or is going to be is going to allow you to go back at any point in time and check what changes were made with that particular ID. In this case, what I want to do is to generate a new file and you can generate a file using touch command and the name of the file you want to create, in this case in the index HTML. And then also I would like to see or also would like to create a, a CSS file styles file styles css perfect we can check out our files exist with ls and you see index and html and styles style css now with git you have a command that allows you to check the status or the, the status of your project of your, your repository it's literally called git status and git status what it's gonna allow us to do is to check what kind of changes we have made, what kind of files are tracked, are, are being traced, or what files are not are not tracked at the moment. If you take a look at this, it says no commits yet, and also it's telling us that there are files that are not tracked. In this case, the index and the style CSS. What we're gonna do, since we need to be able, since we want to track these files, what we're gonna do, and, and that happens whenever there are any changes. So if we would like to track these files, what we're gonna do is use the git add, and then you're gonna type the location and name of that file. So in this case, since I am on the index, on the main git basics folder, and the index HTML is, is right underneath the same folder, then I'm just gonna type index.html file. Once you do that, you just press enter, and then if you do git status again, you will notice my index HTML file now is in green color, and you will see that changes to be committed are including the index HTML file. What happens in here is that the files, the changes are gonna be in different states. One's gonna be the working state, which it's going to be the local state, the, your files are locally. The other one is going to be the staging state. So the staging state, 
are the files or the changes that you have decided that you are flagged or you have marked as changes that you want to push or you want to save on your commit. And of course, there's going to be a commit state where you're telling like, okay, these are the files, these are the changes that I've made uh, for this particular commit. And I would like to include those. So you can include, uh, once again, index.html file in this case. Now I have to include, now I have to include the styles.css file. So I'll do git add styles.css. We do git status. And you will see that both files are included. Now, sometimes what happens is that you don't really want to include all of these files. You just wanted to include or commit the index.html file. And you didn't really intend to, to, by mistake, you just added the styles CSS file. So how can you just remove that in styles that CSS file from that staging state and bring it back to just the working state? We can use the reset command. If you do get reset and type the styles that CSS, the name of the file, and we do git status, you will notice that now our styles that CSS file is not in the staging state. Perfect. Now, something to take into account is that if you do git reset without anything else, it's going to reset absolutely all the files that were in the staging area. That means that if there were index.html file or any other folders in the staging area, they are not going to be in the staging area anymore. And we can check this in the git status using the git status. On the other hand, if you would like to add all of the files with changes to your staging state, what you can do is to use the git add and period man. And that automatically will add all of the files into the staging area. It's files that have, have changes. You can check that using git status. Perfect. Now we have that. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create our commit. With the commit, we're gonna use the git commit. And then we're gonna do hyphen m. The hyphen m is for us to add a message. It's important because that gives us an idea of what kind of things have worked in the past. In generally speaking, whenever you're working on your first commit, it's just normal to just type init commit, initial commit, etc. etc. It's just to set up the repository in itself. But on, on the other hand, if you've been working on stuff, let's say on the contact form, you can say working on the contact form or work on the contact form. But in this case, since I'm just initializing the prop repository and it's my first commit, I'm just gonna type initial commit. Make sure to put it between quotes and then press enter. Perfect. So I don't know if you remember, but I told you that it generates an ID, a commit ID. And that commit ID, what's gonna do is that if at some point in time, I want to check the changes that I made to that particular uh, commit. You will see that that commit is gonna display the changes made on the index.html file and the styles.css file. In this case, we generated those files. Perfect, you just learned your first commit. Now, the next thing what we need to learn is to understand how to use a version control hosting platform. And the one that we're gonna use is gonna be GitHub. So go ahead and open your browser and go to the GitHub page. If you are new to GitHub, just go ahead and sign up and create an account. Once you create an account, what you're gonna do is go to the top navigation panel and you're gonna add a new repository. And you can find it with this plus button uh, right next to your profile image. Uh, you can see new, rep new repository. Once you do that, you're gonna make sure that by default you should select yourself as the owner. And also you're gonna give a repository name. In this case, I'm gonna call it Git Basics. You can provide also an additional description if you want. This is an optional feature. And also there's an ability for you to set it as a public or as a private repository. If I'm not wrong, I'm if I'm around, you can change this feature at the later point in time. If you, for example, made your first repository public, but then you decided to change your mind and you just want to keep it private. You don't want anybody to see your repository. In this case, we can just keep it public. There's an additional uh, settings that you can set up, like add a readme file by default or add a gitignore file. 
which I'll explain in a few minutes, also to choose a license. We can just leave it as it is at the moment. We're gonna create a repository and that should generate a repository link for you, which is gonna be this. There's gonna be two versions, HTTPS and SSH. In this case, we're just gonna work with the HTTPS link. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create in our local repository here, in our terminal in Git Bash, a remote of that local repository. What's a remote? Just in simple words, think about it as my local machine, my local repository is gonna be in sync or it's gonna have an ability to communicate with the GitHub repository and it is up to me to keep it in sync or not whenever I make changes locally. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this link and you're just gonna go back in Bash or to a terminal and you're gonna be, of course, within the Pro Explorer and we're gonna use the git remote add command. So we're gonna do git remote add and then we're just gonna give it a name of that remote and generally speaking, we just use the origin and after that, you're gonna paste the URL in here. And you press enter now in your particular case i'm pretty sure that what's gonna happen is it's gonna try to connect to github to your profile to the git basics uh, repository but you need to provide the credentials in order to access there so probably it's gonna ask you for the username and it's gonna ask you for the password in github once you do that we're gonna have that setup that initial setup now what we need to do is we're gonna push the changes that i have locally on my machine into github and what we need to do is in this case we're gonna use the git push command and there's also an option for the git push and git push it has this set upstream set upstream option what allows you to do is to sync this branch whatever branch you have in your local machine with a branch in github so what do i mean by branches when you have a repository you are you can have multiple branches and whenever whenever you generate a project by default whenever you work on a project it's going to have a branch called master and you can check by typing the git branch command and you'll see that it's going to have master once again you can have multiple branches remember i was telling you about working on different features for example i can have a branch called contact form i can have form, a, a branch called create car another branch called delete car another branch called update car you can have multiple branches where you can work off of and then after you finish working your development you after you finish the development on, the, on, on your particular branch you can merge all of your changes from those branches merge it into the master branch which is going to have the main code base with all of the features so we need to keep it in sync with the with the master branch in github in that way we're gonna do or we're gonna use a command called git push set up stream and then you're gonna type the remote name and i know it sounds weird but the remote name we gave it is origin and then the name of the branch we want to sync which is in this case is gonna be called master and you can also tell because git bash is telling us that we're currently in the master branch I'm gonna press enter and I made a mistake. I mess a hyphen, it's called hyphen hyphen set hyphen upstream. Enter. Look, it's pushing all of those changes to our GitHub, Git Basics project. And if we go back into Git Basics project and refresh, you will see that the index.html file and the styles.css files are now in our hosting repository. Perfect. Congratulations, you just made your first commit and you just push it to GitHub. Perfect. So far, we have made everything in here with the terminal and that's fine. And if you want to see visual representation, what I mean with changes, then I'm just going to open my project. And then I'm going to create a new branch because right now I'm going to work on the basic setup of the index.html file. And how do you create a branch? Remember, I'm working off of the master branch, but I just wanna separate myself from the master branch because I just wanna work on the basic setup on the index.html file. And once I finish that, I'm just gonna merge that in, that all of those changes into my master branch. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new account or a new branch locally. That's gonna be called basic setup. For that, we're gonna use the git checkout hyphen b command and after that you're just gonna give it the name of your of your branch 
make sure it's something readable. In this case, I'm gonna call it basic hyphen page setup. And I'm gonna quickly add some information, make changes in the index HTML file. My, let's call it git basics app. And let's call this my first change. Perfect. You're gonna save, control save if you're using Visual Studio Code. And then if you go back into your terminal and you keep and you check and get status, it's gonna tell you that there have been changes under the index.html file. All we're gonna do is we're gonna commit those changes. So remember we use the git add and we can just use git add and then index.html file. But since I know I wanna commit all of them, I could just do git add period. We check on git status. This step is not necessary, but you can just check it all the time. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the git commit hyphen m and I'm gonna give it a name of basic setup. Perfect. Now we have our first commit. Now this commit is in our local machine. Basic page setup branch is in our local machine. Why? Because if you start taking a look in GitHub and you start refreshing, and then if you go into this little section when it says master and you click on there, the only branch that you're gonna see is gonna be called master. Therefore, we don't really have the basic page setup branch in GitHub. What we need to do is to make sure that we need to keep our local machine, once again, this new branch sync with the GitHub. We used this command before, but we're gonna use it again. We're gonna use the command git push, uh, set upstream. But there's a shortcut for that. If you don't want to just type all of it, you can just use hyphen u. And you're gonna type once again, origin and the name of the branch. In this case, it's gonna be called basic page setup. Perfect, what that's happen what's happening is here is that we're keeping in sync this branch and we're just gonna push the latest changes or the latest commits that we have in this branch locally. So if we refresh GitHub, you will see notification message, a basic page setup branch has been generated pretty much. And you can check all of the branches that you have here. If you click on the basic page setup branch, you're gonna notice messages on different files based on the last commit message that you that I did. So remember the first very first commit that I did was called initial commit. Then I made changes just on the index HTML file and I call basic setup to that commit. Now you can make multiple commits. You can make multiple commits. So for example, if you just keep working on our project, and uh, let's say I decided to add a paragraph. We are learning how to use Git. So I add a paragraph and let's say one more time we'll have Git. And let's say we'll go back to our terminal, bash. We check Git status. Once again, we have changes. So what happens is that once again, we need to create another commit for those changes and we'll do git add. And we need to commit those changes. We're gonna provide git commit hyphen m and we're gonna say added uh, paragraph. And we're gonna press enter. We have our commit. Now we need to keep it in sync and the way you keep it in sync is by pushing the commits. So if you just do git push, that should just push all of those changes. So now there's a point in time where you need to merge your changes into the main branch, into the master branch, right? Because the master branch is not gonna have all of these changes that I made to the index HTML file. How can I check that? Well, we just simply need to check or change branch. How can we check different branches? You can use the git checkout command. You do git checkout and then the name of the branch. In this case, it's gonna be the master branch. Perfect. You see that as soon as I change to the master branch, the index.html file, the contents that I 
I added there, they just went away. Why? Because I don't have those changes in there. If we just go back to our basic page setup branch with Git checkout, you will notice that our changes were there. Once again, because we have that commit and that commit stores all of the changes made at that point in time for that particular branch. But anyway, we need to change, go back into our master branch. And what, what we want to do is to get those changes from the basic page setup into our master branch. How we do that? We use the git merge command. So what we're gonna do is type git merge, and then you're gonna type the name of the branch from where you want to merge into the master branch. So if I would like to get the changes made on the basic setup branch, you can just do basic set page setup. Press enter. And you will see that now our master branch has all of those changes. Now we have those, those changes locally, but we don't have those changes made in our GitHub account. We can always, always double check that and refresh. And uh, we can just check or click under the file index.html and you can see that it's just empty. We go back and you can always verify that by typing git status in your local terminal. If you do git status, it's saying that your branch is, is ahead of origin master by two commits. It's saying that there are changes that are not in GitHub. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use git, git push. We do that, we refresh our page, and now we have all of the latest changes in the index.html file, Here you see. Now there's another command that you need to learn and it's gonna be pull. And what pull does, it, it allows you to be able to get the latest changes from the remote branch, from the origin branch. And remember that the origin branch is gonna be our Git basics project under GitHub. So we're gonna type git pull, and then we're gonna see that really, it's really up to date right now. There are no changes to be made. But let's say that I manually added a file in GitHub in my master branch. Let's see, I'm just gonna add, for example, this add readme file, or you can just manually add a file, create a new file. And I'm gonna call this file readme file. We're gonna type learning the basic commands. And once again, this is a new commit. And you say that it's all create a new file. And we're gonna commit into our master branch. I'm gonna commit the new file. And this is just to symbolize that somebody else might be might have made some changes uh, while you're working on different stuff. But if you start checking your project with ls, you're gonna see that you don't really have those files, right? We're gonna use the git pull in this case to extract or to pull all of the latest changes found in the remote branch. You start looking at that, it's gonna tell you that there's a readme that emd file added that got changed and got inserted and now it's part of our local machine. We can do ls again. And now you'll see that our readme file is in our local machine. Perfect, you just learned the basic commands that you need to learn. Now I'm gonna show you another command that you need to learn and most likely you're gonna use it over and over and over. So let's say you started working for my company and I'm telling you like, hey, you need to go to my repository or to my GitHub account and go to my repository called Mario, Mario Friends. Uh, what we need to do is, and I need you to start working on a new feature. But first you need to get the project, your local machine. How do you do that? We're gonna do it by cloning it. In order to clone it, we're gonna use the git clone command and type the address where your repository is located. So the first thing is that we're just gonna place ourselves in a different location. In the terminal, we're gonna get back in here. And now that I'm in the repos folder, I'm gonna type git clone. And after I type the git clone, I need to get the location 
the URL of that particular GitHub repository. You can just copy it. If you click on it on, on code and then select HTTPS, copy, and then paste it in here. And if you notice, it's gonna be cloning all of the files that are under that folder. And you can verify by just simply going to that new repository folder. Generally, it's gonna create a new folder with the same name of that repository, this K called Mario Friends. So I'm gonna go to that repository locally. It's called Mario Friends. And then now we are in that project. And if you wanna see that there's pretty much all of those files are accessible for me, you can just type ls and see that all of the files are available for me. Or instead, you can also open your Visual Studio Code or your IDE of choice and open that folder. We open the folder and now we have access to all of these files. Congrats. You just learned the basic commands for you to understand how to use Git version control. And one more thing, in case you might forget all of these commands and you just don't remember, you simply go into Git documentation. You can check the documentation. I can provide this link. Or also, you can just access the terminal. They can give you help, actually. If you type git hyphen hyphen help, they're gonna give you all the commands available for Git with a little brief description of what they mean and how you can use them. The last thing that I forgot to tell you is why do we need a dot git ignore file? That git ignore file is generally used to not or to prevent from pushing files into our remote branches, into our GitHub accounts, for example, in our GitHub project. Why? Because that might contain sensitive information, confidential information, such as API keys, password, username, stuff like that, that you really don't want it to be accessible. Even within, even if your project is private, there are some things that you don't really want to to submit to make them available online sometimes also you want to make uh, available uh, packages that you install in your project because you can just install it anytime you clone your project in your local machine so it's not really necessary to keep them in your repository because it's gonna add as well a lot of extra weight that you don't really need so how does git ignore work the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna need to create a dot git ignore file Perfect. And let's say at some point in time, I decided to create my environments variable file. And that file is generally used for you to store environment variables that you're gonna use for your project, uh, passwords, etc. right? So I can have password environment variable. I can call it 741. I can call it, I can give it any random number, right? And then if we take a look at our project, Git status, the latest changes. We're gonna see that we're gonna have a .env file and then a .git ignore file. But then I really don't want to include that .env file. Go to the git ignore file and add the name of the files that you want to include. In this case, it's called .env. Save it. And then once you do one more time git status, Git ignore is literally gonna ignore that DNV file and it's gonna tell like, hey, I don't want to try any changes made on that env file. Now what we can do is just, we're gonna create a commit. We're gonna add that file. We can create a commit message. Add git ignore file. File. And then we're just gonna push it or keep it in sync with our GitHub repository. By the way, a good rule of thumb is to pull, pull always before pushing. Somebody might have to make changes on the project, changes that you really don't have locally and you might be overriding those changes. So let's do a pull first, a sanity check, and then we're gonna do git push. We do git push, and we're gonna have our git ignore file here. Last but not least, I wanted to give you piece, home pieces of recommendation. One is commit as many times as you can. I'm not saying that you're just gonna commit any change that you have made every second ago, every minute ago, no. But it's good 
practice to commit as many times as possible. For example, two hours, three hours, four hours, every change that you have made within that span of amount of time, you should commit. Committing once again, once a day might be okay, but still I highly recommend multiple commits once a day. Why? Because that allows for you to not only being able to keep track of those changes, but let's say at some point your computer is just crash it's not working anymore and you didn't commit those changes how are you going to get access to those changes that you, the, the last changes that you work on right you can just simply open another computer and then go to your github account and just pull the latest changes but since you didn't do those things then you're just going to start to work all the way from zero another thing is that and that has happened to us and that has happened to me it's an experience is working with other developers and the other developers for example have development done a specific feature and then they don't commit and what happens is that they maybe get sick and they cannot go back to work and pretty much is they that development is done in their local machines we don't have access to that so we will have to start all the way from zero from scratch another recommendation that i give you is to always pull before pushing by pulling you can always get the latest changes that are in github or in your repository it's very critical just do this before pushing do pull even if you just push just a second ago please just pull another recommendation if you watch all whole video is to work on independent branches especially if multiple people are working on multiple features therefore you can just create your branch separate from the main branch or the master branch to develop your own functionality and then merge it into a master branch there you are and that's all for today i hope this video was helpful for you and was very informative if you are a new programmer i highly recommend you to go over these things you're gonna need to learn this because this is something that you're gonna use over and over and over on a daily basis and probably if you don't know all of the commands don't worry it's something that since you're gonna use it so many times it's gonna be part of your memory in no time so don't worry about it you're just gonna keep it you're just gonna retain that information fairly quick Please, if you want to show me some support, give it a thumbs up to the video and as well as writing some comments in the description below if you like it as well. If you had some problems, please just write in as well and I will do my best to, to help you. And that's all for today. And in Spanish, I would say ciao ciao. But since it's in English, bye bye. See you the next time.